and I'm sitting in this taxi now and I'm getting closer to Dublin Airport. I am excited, but I'm, I'm very nervous as well and, and a bit scared because I literally don't know what to expect. I will be very emotional and yet I won't want to show it because I will want to look strong and of course I'll have God and the angels there as well so I know it will go brilliantly. There's no turning back now. <laughs> After a tiring eight-hour flight, Lorna arrived in Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia. It is a beautiful country with a long and rich history, considered to be the birthplace of modern mankind. It is not without its problems, though, due to a series of famines in the 1980s and, more recently, unpredictable rain patterns due to climate change. With 94 million inhabitants, it is one of the most populated countries on Earth. We started our journey with a 350-kilometre drive to Deborah Marcus in the central part of Ethiopia, a town of around 90,000 people where many of the projects are situated. It was the stories of street children here in Deborah Marcos, told to Lorna by Father Owen of APA, that first made her want to help the children. Lorna visited Birat Tesva, a fantastic association for orphaned and vulnerable children who have lost one or both parents. The community came up with the idea of buying some land and building the dormitories for the young street children and scholarships to become whatever they want to become, you know, giving them a chance just like every other child that has parents. I think that's very important and I was actually delighted to go there and even to see the play they put on for us. It is estimated that there are close to one million AIDS orphans in Ethiopia. Other children end up on the street because of poverty, abuse, conflict and trafficking. One of the success stories of Bir Tesfe is 18-year-old orphan and former street child, Asubalu Tesfe. APA found him on the street and have a scholarship for him for going to university. With the support of the foundation, he has helped with his education and accommodation. He says, I want to be a doctor. I want to contribute to the world for the help that I'm getting. I will become a successful human. I think you will become successful. That particular young man is actually right in here in my heart. The projects really help children reach their potential and for Isubalu, who is a good student, the future is bright. Not only does he study hard, but in his free time, he shines shoes to help with the rent. The foundation is also involved in educating and empowering women. This has a huge effect on children's lives in this region, and collaborating with local authorities and various religious leaders is of utmost importance for all the projects. What I, I thought was absolutely wonderful was all of the mothers generating income through different activities. Simple things, sometimes it was sheep, it was weaving, you know, even making food and, and selling it. And there were so many different ways that the women were generating income to support themselves and their children. I really felt very overwhelmed and yet very joyful. I don't know how to express it at the moment because we're only the second day in. You know, at times I feel like laughing and at times I feel like crying. And I, I, I would love to be able to help so much more. I just, it's a completely different world as well. 
A new day dawns and another project to visit, this time the women's prison in Deborah Marcus. It's a more open model than our prisons. The women here are in for petty crimes, often resorting to stealing to provide food for their children. We went into where their beds were and I met one of the mothers in there who actually had this tiny baby, this beautiful little child, and it goodled and gaddled at me. It's not unusual for children to be in prison here. When they're old enough, they go out to school during the day and return to their mothers at night. So you have come back from school? As we walked through the prison, the officer was telling me that in this dorm they're going to put in three toilets and a shower for the women. The inmates, they learn how to build and at the moment, they were building the sewer system for the section of the women's prison. And to me, that is wonderful to think of inmates doing all of that work. Making this prison a good and positive place for the women and children. The project here is not only helping the prison authorities with the installation of a sanitation system, but also giving inmates the skills to learn their own income generating activities. So when they're released from prison, they won't ever have to come back. And then I remember just seeing a load of women doing weaving, spinning and making scarves. And I saw these big, huge baskets for wedding ceremonies. Not so easy. <laughs> I just got up in among the women and I asked them, could they teach me how to spin the tread? And I can tell you, I had all the women laughing, including myself and the officers, because I wasn't very good at it. But eventually I managed to do a string. But it was very positive there because the women, you know, weren't just in prison sitting around with their children doing nothing. They were actually getting skills. This is how they were making an income and they were able to send money outside the prison to their family. The officer just said to me at one point, Lorna, there's a hairdresser's here. And I said, what? <laughs> and I was introduced to the young woman who was training the other women to be hairdressers. It was just great fun in there, and she didn't have any English, but I was told that she was apologizing because she couldn't finish my hair because she had to be at court. <laughs> and I thought that was so, so funny. I never thought I would have an occasion like this in my life, and to believe I got that opportunity in a prison, that's even more incredible. In Ethiopia, it can be very difficult for people to support themselves and their children. Many women who work in local bars find themselves forced into commercial sex work. By organising these bar workers into associations, these women can get help with health education and life skills. We met with 23-year-old Sintayu Waku, who had been forced into commercial sex work to support her child. I just felt so moved when she told her story. I, to me, that must be a very hard thing to do. The APA have helped them so much to fight for their rights, you know, to be educated, to learn about the risks of HIV. As a fitting end to the Deborah Marcus leg of our journey, we went with Sintayu to the local Ethiopian Orthodox Church to celebrate the Feast of Our Lady. Orthodox services can last for hours and this service continued late into the evening where we shared our faith with our Ethiopian brothers and sisters. As we travelled back towards Addis Ababa from Deborah Marcus, 
we took a detour off the main road into the hinterland to visit a drought-affected area. As we got further and further from the main road, the tarmac came to an end and the earth got drier and drier. It hasn't rained here for two years. The crops have failed and the ground is as hard as iron. As you drove deeper into it, it became more barren. We went to a water hole. We were up on the road and, and you had to kind of look down and you could see crowds of women and children. I just found it very moving when I saw the little drop of water that filled this little hole from beneath stones and just seeing this little cup being filled and then poured into a 20 litre container and that's all a family could have. I doubt it. Ugh. No. <laughs> These women were collecting the water. They'd spend all day, hours and hours. You know, and all of that was a shock. And looking at the kids and seeing, you know, their clothes and tatter and, you know, they had nothing. It was just so heartrending, and one of the farmers saying, you know, we haven't grown anything, it's no point sowing seed, because there's nothing will grow. And we have to remember as well, they're having drought because of us here in Europe, America, China, because of all the pollution we're putting into the air. We have changed the climate on them. So pray for rain. That's what I'm praying for, for June and July. That's when they need it. Back in Addis Ababa, we visited the Atsit Tekla Georges Elementary School, run by the Daughters of Charity, which receives no support from external NGOs or the government. This school educates children from disadvantaged communities in the belief that education is often the only way to rise out of poverty. The children came from the shanty town, so their parents didn't have much. I just remember walking into the classroom and the teacher welcoming us. And all the children were in a circle and they sang us songs. It was like head and shoulders, knees and toes, and twinkle, twinkle, little star, and their ABCs. Nowadays, in private school, they use different technology here only we are depending on the textbook. We don't have any other extra to help them, to support them. For example, if you want to show them teaching aids, even uh, practical, it is hard for, to prepare all the paper for all the children. It is hard for us. That is also a challenge. Sister Belenish and her 680 pupils are reliant on donors. Since some children arrive hungry to school, they are provided with meals to help them concentrate. Many children can't afford the uniforms to go to school, so the nuns also keep second-hand uniforms to clothe them. I can't even pronounce it. So how old are you? What age? Seven. One thing I loved, they really interacted with me. And on the wall behind the children, it was written, the future belongs to the young. Children have a right to be educated, and, and we have to help. I always remember at the end of the day, you know, just waving to say goodbye to them, and they started to pass me by, and the next minute they put their hands up, you know, give me five, you know, so I, here I was doing five, five, all the way down through the line.
Leaving Addis Ababa behind, we started a 450 kilometer journey southwest to Bangui in the Kefa zone, the home of coffee. Ethiopia is huge. You'd fit Ireland into it 13 times over, and it's amazingly diverse. The landscape changed dramatically as we headed southwest to Bonga to visit the Menja people. Menja traditionally live deep in the rainforest and rely on making and selling charcoal for a living. But now that the forests are protected, they are being excluded from their habitat and their income. Menja have been discriminated against, not unlike some of our own ethnic minorities. And the programme here is trying to integrate the Menja people with the majority Gomero tribe by starting integrated kindergartens and through adult literacy activities. I remember when we reached the small village and being brought up towards one of the houses that we could go and visit. And they invited me into their home. We went in this tiny door and I had to wait for a moment for my eyes to adjust. Do all the children go to school? Will they be able to go to school someday? Do you have a long way to go to collect water? Is it clean enough? <laughs> what food do they eat? I'm kind of a little shocked myself that life isn't a little bit easier, that life hasn't been, you know, that, that the people don't have sheep or cattle or clean water, you know, because I know they, they should have. I would like to say thank you to you all for welcoming me here because to me it's a privilege to come into someone else's home, someone else's culture, their lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We said goodbye to this community of Menja, knowing that on the one hand, the government is doing all it can to preserve the rainforest. But unfortunately, on the other hand, it is marginalising the Menja people further. Their future is very uncertain unless they are allowed to integrate with the community at large. We then travelled to visit the Chena Warada Kindergarten School, where 72 Menja and Gamero children are being educated together. Traditionally, the majority Gomero have discriminated against the minority Menja. I remember looking up and seeing this one little house in the distance and when we got up there, I could see all of the children and they were very excited. And straight away, they started to sing. To see the excitement of them was really, you know, overwhelming, joyful. It's hoped that by integrating this generation of children, discrimination will become a thing of the past. But the project doesn't stop with the children. There's also an adult literacy programme where parents from both tribes are being educated together. One of the great things was seeing the parents there to learn as well playing their part. The two tribes were mixing. And I know they have within their lives some negative things, but culturally, you know, they're trying to integrate. They were doing everything possible. They just need a little helping hand.
Leaving the Menja school behind, we set out on the last leg of the Ethiopian trip to learn more about water, something we take for granted here in the West. One of the biggest challenges facing school children in Ethiopia is access to clean water. Girls tend to drop out of school at puberty if they don't have access to clean water and sanitation, and waterborne diseases account for one in five of all infant deaths. Poor infrastructure and changing rainfall patterns due to climate change contribute to Ethiopia's desperate shortage. The first site we visited was an unprotected spring, typical of rural Africa. I really didn't know what to expect, what they were going to show me. And I was told it's in there among the bushes. And I was actually quite shocked when somebody said, look, the frogs, and this is water the people drink. And there was other kind of critters in the water as well. <laughs> then this young girl came along and she started to fill a container for drinking. You know, they were drinking from this spring, but the water was absolutely filthy. You know, how many times has she gone there to fill that? And how many times has her family drank? So I'm hoping that in the future that this spring can be protected. One such site with a very successful protected spring project is in a remote village called Yena. We travelled deep into the mountains. The last 40 kilometres of this journey was on gravel roads. And when they ran out, we bounced across rivers and up dirt tracks. And finally, when they ran out, we finished the journey on foot. The village people were just so anxious to show us this well that they have, which was way up in the mountain. The people themselves built this massive area. I thought that was really wonderful because if you don't involve the people, they have no interest. This project is run by a committee from the local village and people using the water points have to pay a maintenance fee of one cent per 25 litres. This may not sound like much, but incomes here are very low, so it's a significant weekly spend. Water from the protected spring flows down a pipe and supplies two schools and three water points in the village. People's lives here have been changed for the better by one simple well and a little bit of external help. Gone forever are the days of waterborne diseases and needless infant deaths. To me, that was incredible. When something is done to protect a natural spring and what a difference it makes to their lives. It gives them hope, gives them belief again. Just down the hill from the spring is the secondary school for boys and girls they now benefit from an abundant supply of fresh, clean water from their own water point. The girls brought me in and we turned on the taps and they washed their face and, you know, they drank the water, they splashed about. They were just so delighted because it made such a difference to their lives. It's just incredible to think these young women have water now in the school and give these young people a life, an education and for their dreams to come true. And I'd love to try drinking some. Oh, that was absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Just water gives back people dignity. It gives them back a life. It gives them the opportunities to learn. It gives children the opportunity is to be able to go to school, to have water. To think about it back home here in Ireland, I know you'd be saying, I don't be crazy. But I can tell you, to be able to turn on a tap and let it flow over your hands, it's like gold. So all as I can tell everyone abroad is that this country is absolutely beautiful and a beautiful people and absolutely gorgeous children 
that just want to have the opportunity to learn and to have a normal life like you and me, everyone else. It's very hard to describe now that I'm back six weeks or so because my time over there in Ethiopia was very heartrending. You know, the people were absolutely beautiful and, and friendly and, you know, they were full, full of life and, and enthusiasm, but they were struggling. What struck me the most... That's really a hard question to answer because literally everything did. I don't have words. I don't have words. And just even the thoughts of it is, is pulling at my heart here now. You know, I want to cry, but I'm saying, no, don't cry. You can't do that. You're on camera. <laughs> you know, just trying to hold it all, all together because it was so moving. I suppose just seeing and knowing what's happening over there, all of the projects and what hope it's giving. And even my, my friend, the boy who shines shoes and realizing the potential that he has because he wants to be a doctor and he's so determined. And please God, he will become a brilliant doctor and go out into the world. And now coming home here, it's like, coming back to another world, another reality, and just seeing how much we have. We have to somehow share with them some of what we have because their children are part of the future as well. Now that you've seen all of the wonderful work, I'm going to ask you to please, please donate to the Lorna Burns Children Foundation to give a child hope for a future. So please help.